never guess what I had to contend with just now at the back door. Two sailor lads looking for congenial company. Well, I sent them across the way I did over to that cavalting house. Hopefully they'll satisfy their lustful needs over there. Mind you, not that I'm one to pass any rumors about, but did you not hear what happened to Mary Palmer? Well, Mary Palmer, she's been living here for quite some time, and uh, she's been doing her business out on the street, you might say. Well, she has a fine figure and a, a lovely face, but I dare say they are of the masculine order. Well, in the course of her speculations last Friday night, she encountered a certain officer of the army. Not that I'm giving away any names, but I can attest to the fact that he was right in this bar, downing the gin like there was no tomorrow. He staggers out, and Mary comes up to him and proposes that he follow her over to her fire ship over there, to the brothel. Well, he was so inebriated that he immediately fell asleep on the bed. And I, I guess this did not sit well with Mary, so she decided to go out and be amongst her friends on the street where she'd left them. I suppose she had a certain inclination to ascertain just how far she might be able to make the women jealous of each other if she were to dress herself up as a dandy. <laughs> oh, Mary Palmer. I'll never see him again, never. No one knew of my affection for Captain Milnes. I did not confess the affairs of my heart to anyone, not even to Dorothea, our trusted servant and my nanny since coming to the Canadas. My father, Lieutenant General Sir George Prevost, would have frowned upon the mere notion that his daughter Anne would have been enamored of this particular military officer. And my mother, Lady Prevost, she had discouraged any such infatuation. But Henry, Captain Milnes, he was different. His whole countenance was both pleasing and intelligent. In fact, he was the most agreeable person I ever met with. I frankly acknowledge that I could not see so much of his character or receive so much of his attention without my heart feeling at some danger. I resolved to keep my heart at true diligence until such time as it was truly sought. And if he had tried to gain my affection, surely he would have succeeded. Oh, this? Oh, well, that's on account of my hip. Oh, I thought everyone knew. Oh, did you not hear about the raid on our settlement of Gananoque? Oh, my husband, Colonel Joel Stone, he was away in Kingston with the militia at the time. He said, mind you, bar the doors, Abigail. Well, a lot of good that did us. That rapscallion of a man Forsyth coming over like that. Well, he burned the storehouse. I knew he'd be coming to our home next. Well, I gathered up all the gold as fast as I could, and I put it into the soap barrel. He didn't get that. And then I took my feet as fast as they would carry me up to the attic. And just in time, too. Oh, I heard them smashing through the windows, crashing all of my china on the floor and turning everything every which way. Well, I was scared, and I knocked over a crate. Well, of course I screamed. And the next thing I knew, bang, I'd been shot in the hip. Thank the Lord we arrived before dark. Oh, it is a dangerous enterprise to be traveling through these 
uncivilized parts of the country, especially after nightfall. Well, at least the accommodations are uncontaminated and the food is adequate. Well, provisions have been hard to come by since the war began and Widow Wilson is a very resourceful woman. <laughs> This is not the first time that I have stayed here. Oh no, my husband, surely you know my husband. Major Francis Coburn, he's an officer with the Royal Canadian Fencibles and I am his wife, Alicia. Oh, well, as I was saying, we have taken refuge here on more than one occasion. In fact, it is about the best that one can find between, I don't know, Kingston and Cornwall. <laughs> oh, my noble lord is in Cornwall, attending to one of his military functions, and I am on my way to meet him. <gasps> no, I, I didn't come here alone, heavens no. I came with my trusted servant and our driver. Well. We have just returned from an excursion to the United States under the flag of truce. <laughs> I dare say the Yankees do treat us women with uncommon civility and they allow us to travel about much more and peep about much more. In fact, I have some very important information to share with Francis when next I see him. <laughs> Ah, there's many a broken heart with this terrible war. Many a broken heart. And I thank the Lord I have my daughters with me, Harriet and Jemima. Handsome looking girls they are. And the soldier lads, don't they know it too? Coming in here, wooing my daughters, trying to take them away from me. Well, my daughters will not be wed to a soldier lad. Not as long as I, Widow Wilson, walk on God's green earth. I tell my girls that a marriage to a military man is a sentence of a most deplorable life. Imagine, I tell them, imagine subjecting yourself to a life of exposure in some far off lonely encampment, or worse, oh, being abandoned for months at a time, you with we children, oh, all alone and full of anxiety and despair amongst unpitying strangers, dragging your family from pillar to post, and you suffering all the distress and deteriorating influences of campaigning and garrison life. Oh, and if your husband should die, oh, you'd have to be married within a fortnight to another soldier, a complete stranger and you'd be a slave to his every beck and call. No, my daughters will not be married to a soldier lad. 